Hi, my name is Jacob Rogers. I'm going to be reading from a Galician novel by Berta Davila, um, which came out in 2020 and which I'm seeking a publisher for if anyone is interested after this. I'm going to read uh, from the very end of the first chapter, so I'll just give some context that uh, in in the novel, or in the first novel in the novel, the narrator goes to her old childhood apartment with her sister to see if the person who lives there will let them go in so that they can explore. Um, so I will, I will, they're in the middle of that process, and I will start reading from there. On our way down, my sister notices the mailboxes in the entryway. One of them has the name Amandine written on it, along with her last name, Dupont. Her name is Amandine Dupont. The letters and junk mail overflow out of her mail slot, as if she doesn't live here. But the other night, when Carlos and I walked by, someone had turned on a light in the apartment, and it's clear that someone lives here most of the time. Someone easily confused, someone who doesn't hear the intercom, who forgets to pick up her mail every day someone like Amandine. These are all characteristics of Amandine Dupont, the woman who lives in my home. We leave that street and neighborhood, walking slowly and feeling like our search was pointless and absurd. We know nothing about Amandine Dupont aside from the assumption that she must be French. Is she elderly? A student here for, this, for a semester at the Faculty of History? I walk my sister back home, then return to mine and tell Carlos that I want to have lunch at that new creperie we went to last summer. He spent the whole morning writing, is still in his pajamas, and doesn't feel like going out, so he suggests we order delivery. Like most people, my relationship with my frustrations can take unexpected forms. When I was seven months pregnant, I attended my first birth class. They handed me a pink folder and some anti-stretch mark creams. The symbolism, the symbolism of all this pre-maternal paraphernalia was so infuriating to me that I bought an eccentric crocodile stuffed animal for my son's crib the moment I left. I was determined to raise him without bows or pastel colors, with stretch marks on my hips. I opened my laptop to look up the crepery and find its phone number. It's the first result. Underneath the photos of the menu and the interior of the restaurant, I see a list of comments by users who have collectively rated it three and a half stars. Among them is a brief review by Amandine Dupont. It's her. Her name, identical to the one on the mailbox, glows blue over a few sentences where she recommends the vegan crate and praises the efficient service and the authenticity of their recipes. Beside it, there's a small orange asterisk that identifies her as a local guy. In other words, Amandine Dupont frequently leaves comments about the places she goes to in the city. It's her. It's unbelievable how much you can learn about someone simply by their traces on the internet. Amandine has left comments for various restaurants with vegetarian options and a complaint about the veterinary care her pet received at a clinic near the mall. My dog was terrified the moment we walked in, the doctor was unfriendly, and the prices were excessive, she wrote. I also noticed one of her recommendations, an organic grocery store. I go every week and now call Alicia a friend, Amandine had written. I find myself surprised at the thought that my home, because I can't stop calling it that, has a dog living in it now. I order the same vegan crepe Amandine recommended on the internet for delivery. This, I think, is the point when things start to take a unique turn, as if shepherded by a larger narrative. Carlos and I eat at his desk, idly listening to the news, and he asks me what I'm thinking about. When he asks me these kinds of questions, it feels like he's knocking on the door to my subconscious. I'm thinking that I subscribe to everything Amandine said about the vegan crepe, and that I need to meet the person who has supplanted me in that apartment. I look for a journal on the top shelves of the bookcase in the living room, and start to write some quick notes about what has happened over the past few weeks, and more importantly, the past few hours. This is how novels begin for me, but I don't say a word to Carlos, or anyone else. I want to keep the secret to myself for a little while. We move on to talking about my grandmother, Maria, who's not well. She recently received a terrible diagnosis, but my entire family continues to pretend otherwise, and we only talk about it out of the fear that this will likely be our last normal summer with her. Concerned, Carlos reminds me that it really is a dire prognosis, but I'm lost in thought about my grandmother's delicate strength and about the beautiful ingenuity with which she has responded to her illness. Aging can be like throwing a snowball down a ski slope. 
It might end like it might end with a head-on crash, or dissolve slowly among this, the magnitude of the slope. But once you've started going down, there's no stopping the laws of gravity. Thanks for listening.